Good morning, good morning, St. Martin. What's up? What's cooking? March 28, 2023, episode 71. Let me hold on a minute and see that we have connection. So I'll just hold on a minute to see if um, I get anyone on. Once I see that, I know we are connected and I will get going. So I'll just take a break, take a sip of coffee. And we have people on, that's for sure. So, all right, let's go with this thing. What a, what a week, what a week we had. Not only did we have, um, did I participate all week and uh, we closed over the weekend with the IKEA project of the Lions. Um, and I'll talk about that a little later. But we also had a marathon session with the budget and at all costs, naturally, they wanted to pass that budget, good or bad, uh, balanced or imbalanced, approved by CFT or not. They were going to pass a budget and they were going to present that to the governor and we will see where that goes from there. But I'll discuss the budget a little later. I think um, it merits a little attention because it was one of those comical shows that you know we normally have once a year when the budget, the budget goes in and, and you know, you can ask anything, say anything, do anything, and uh, both parties, so well the government or and the presenters, be the ministers or their colleagues or, or their support staff, they all have immunity, so everybody talking, ranting and raving. We also had a great uh, Calypso eliminations on Friday. I, must, I attended the show myself and I must honestly say it was wonderful. A great, great show. Very unfortunate uh, with the disqualifications that followed after the fact. But, you know, there's, there's a lesson to be learned here um, because I'm not going to criticize the carnival committee or the judges or the participants. I think um, when we define originality, um, we need to define it very carefully. If it is used in a pageant show, it's okay. If it is used in a show abroad, it's not okay. And either we say if the song was ever used, it can be used again. Then, 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 then we are clear, no matter where you use it. If you use it for public consumption in anything, or you gave it to somebody else to use for public consumption, then it, it stops there. But you see, again, um, the problem is this. The problem is that at this point in time, that's not clear because there were other songs that have been sang before that were sang that night and were not disqualified. And that's where I'm going to leave it for now. I see um, a gentleman asked me, respected MP, did you mention that CFT is not in agreement with the draft budget? Yes, I said so. And I'll tell you why. Because they vetted the budget, not the amended budget, where changes were made, where monies were added in and move. Um, so again, if that is not balanced, then the CFT did not give a favorable opinion. And that's the question that's going to be, have to be answered now. That's why I said, you know, when you do things in haste and you still want to please people, you get these problems. So I, I know the capital expenses has been adjusted in such a way, now they're going to say, oh, capital expenses are not part of the budget. Yes, they are, because you're taking a loan what that budget is tied to. Because in the decree, there was a problem here, I noticed. Um, I am going to see if I can put in the thing on now. Yes, we are back on again. Thank God for that. All right. So, as we go along, um, like I said, an eventful week last week. I noticed we have an agreement, or we are coming to an agreement for 5G. My problem is this. We can't even handle 3G and ensure that the people get quality for their money. Not quantity, quality. Too often, we are still having problems with the internet. Now you're going to 5G for the surrounding islands and St. Martin is signing on to this. Again, 5G means better speeds, you can do a lot more, uh, especially for businesses, it goes faster banks, and so I understand all that. But what is this going to cost? Because 3G already costs us, us an arm and a leg. 
So what this going to cost now? Because when you look at the surrounding islands, uh, when I look at Aruba and Curacao, what they pay for their download and upload speeds is far less than what we are paying right now. So again, my question is, and again, I would welcome 5G with open arms because in the States, they don't reach 10G with Xfinity. But are we going to get quality service? Because just to say we got 5G for the sake of 5G, no, then keep it and let's uh, stick to what we, what we have right now. Now, last week in the editorial, I, I, I read a titled um, part, Ill-Advised, and it was somewhat confusing to me. And while I wholeheartedly agree that the timing was wrong and more importantly, the message it was sending was one of interference, be it geopolitically or locally, that, that was true. Look, I understand that because the Prime Minister said it, it was ill-advised. But let's be honest, Mr. Editor. You, better than anybody, knows exactly how that works. You know exactly when you write, what you write, and why you write it. And you say, ill-advised? You should be ashamed of yourself because the media should stop playing politics themselves because they do that extremely well and when you call them out on it they get upset with you because i have called them out before and they got upset they send messages to my people i don't care you know, you know that by now i know by now the herald must know i don't care i will say what i think needs to be said in this country and unfortunately, they come up with the aspect of trias politicas. Really? I mean, you all have the gall to talk about trias politicas when you have seen judgments made in St. Martin that were totally, totally political? When a judge could say, I am not going to sentence those people if you all don't drag the ringleader in here so I can sentence him. You recall that? I can't recall you all writing negative about it and recalling three F politicas being involved. Man, please, you all got to stop this nonsense, all right? We have too many court decisions that are politically motivated. We have investigations in this country that are politically motivated. You don't write about them. You had one lady who used to work there. I don't even know if she works there anymore called me and asked me about my story because she found that the justice system was just simply too corrupt. But you all have never written about that. You never wrote about that. But that's three years politicas. Because when they start to interfere with the executive or legislative branch, you got a problem. Because then three years politicas has just turned into a police state. So please, Mr. Editor, those type of ill-advised editorials, keep them to yourself. Because that, what you did, was ill-advised. Now let's move on. So, we have a lawsuit by GB against the Aurora Group that handled the hack back in March of 2022. Now I am confused altogether. Because I thought Aurora came in and was paid a lot of money, and I can remember a media house, a digital media house, writing about it and saying something was wrong. And maybe the good lady had more insight than a lot of other people, because now suddenly GB is taking that company to court, and not the hackers. So I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what they're not releasing any information. Because there's a court case ongoing. But you know what? Hotful. In the December of 2022, the government got the GB report. And it's more than just this company had to be going to courts. GB had a list of people that they could have um, taken to courts for what happened. So, I, I, you know, we need to stop playing games. GB, we can't afford as country St. Martin that GB goes belly up. GB is in serious financial problems. 
GB is having problems where they are cutting off big users with or without calling them because I was on a show and the host told me they cut a big hotel and they didn't even call the hotel. Now I ain't going down that road right now because I don't know who called who, who didn't send notices. What I do know is a lot of people still ain't getting bills. And that group of people we got to be careful with because yes, you can tell me but they didn't come and pay. But if you're not telling them anything, it means your database is no good. Absolutely no good. And then you have a bigger problem than just some people not paying you. Because all you want now is that people come and make a deposit for what they use. And I support that. I truly support that. But our problems are bigger now at GB than even one year ago when this happened. Because we thought we had it under control. We were told that everything was retrieved by a former temporary director, which was blatantly a big lie. Because clearly, a lot of data is still not there and a lot of people are not even in the system. The whole billing system is down. So again, I don't want to go down there too deep because I don't have enough information. But what I am saying, that part is factual because they were in the media. Now, sewage. Sewage water running down LB Scott Road from the intersection there by Peach Drive and it has now become a very serious issue. For months it's running. For months. Not days. I spoke about this before. I sent the documentation to the Ministry of Rumi, in particular to the Head of Infrastructure Management. Because I'm going to start calling names eventually. Because this is nonsense. I get back an answer. We're working on it, Tone. Inspection is dealing with it. Great. We know where the water coming from. We know where it's coming from. You go up there today, it's still running. It's still running. Just build a new road on both roads, new layers. I, I, I don't think they fixed the foundation fully. Go down there around the house from the late Eki Richardson. Barrage of water on the road again. And it's going to remain so. Because the geniuses that fixed that didn't fix the drain. And if you don't fix the drain, the water going to remain on the road. Because the drain higher than the road. So the water can't get off. And hoping to run it down, down by EBS is just wishful thinking. Because it fills up with dirt and it's going to block up the road. The water can't move. These are things that can be fixed. They're not that difficult. But instead of fixing that, because we ain't got the money to fix it, we jump on planes and we go to UN Congresses talking about waste water, talking about water production. You don't have water production here because it's owned by a company from abroad. They do the water. You can't run the sewage plant because you have no clue what's going on there. You don't fix the drains because for a year and a half, we haven't cleaned the waterways in Samaritan. And we got, right now, the people from Nature Foundation and Epic and all of them, Pride, screaming murder. But you're going conference. You think painting a little bus stop in the weekend with a little yellow paint is going to make the public of Samantha say, oh, it's okay that he missed the budget meeting? You got to be the biggest fool walking on two feet. But we're going to deal with you. Because I'm done with you for sure. Others might say, oh, don't worry, little boy, man, little boy, tired. Little boy is stupid. The little boy has to be dealt with. The little boy has to be exposed. One was exposed already. Clean and diesel up again. Five cents. Now, remember, I warned that fuel will continue rising and will peak someplace in May. That's what the World Bank and the stocks are saying. They expect in May to reach the highest peak and then we might be coming down once again. So it means for now, for the next two months, April and May, we are still going to be uh, dealing with these prices going up and utilities does going up and shipping does going up and food does going up because we import everything. Even tickets to travel next door are up by a few dollars too much. Let me congratulate Dr. Anders Linda Richardson. I have known this lady for a very, very, very long time. And I was so happy 
that she brought us a book where, and let me say it correct, Trilingual Terminology in Criminal Proceedings in Dutch, English, and Spanish. Every suspect has a right to a translator when they go to courts. And most of the suspects that go to courts either speak Dutch, English, Spanish, or French. So I know they're working right now on the French terminology also, so that suspects and their lawyers and the judges themselves and the prosecutors and the court recorders or anybody who is working on those cases <coughs> sorry dear, have an understanding of what is being said in their language that they command. So to Mrs. Um, Linda Richardson, who was a um, certified translator and court interpreter for 20, 25 years already, uh, thank you very much, much appreciated. I think the people that would find themselves in need of this will be greatly appreciative of what you did there. A lot of people don't understand that, but they will be. So, last week we had budget meeting and I think for one or two days they had issues with a, a new system, a system that was bought and installed. What, what caught my eye was when they said that the system can't be repaired locally. Um, they have to fly in people to go and repair. We buy a system and we are not going to train people in Samantha to operate the system. I, 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 I was in Parliament. Parliament has people that are more than capable to be taught how to operate it and troubleshoot it. So I was very disheartened when I heard that statement. But unfortunately, I leave it to where that is for now. Now, you know, I... I laughed when I read the article from the, the Central Bank of Curaçao and St. Martin when they said in the launch, you know, they, they, they are looking at launching the Caribbean Gilded Digitalized and they were hoping when they launch it that it will resolve the 17% of the people of St. Martin that have absolutely no banking ties. So they only deal with cash. And I had the biggest joke. It, it, I, I had a good laugh. And people say, well, why would you laugh? That's not funny. It is. Because it is not now that this problem is there. This problem is there. And while I was in Parliament, and I'll give um, MP Rolando Bryson kudos on it, he was the, the one pulling it that the banking world in St. Martin is as chaotic and as discriminatory as it can be. Certain people cannot get bank accounts, and then they say, oh, they don't have no proper address. Oh, they don't have, um, they can't show where the money come from, or they don't have enough money. Those are reasons listed. And if we would digitalize the Caribbean Gilda, where are they going to bank it? I mean, how stupid are, 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 are we all? Yeah. To, to do digitalized banking, you must have a bank account, sir. But no. <laughs> we go just throw it up in the air as if everybody in Samantha must be some idiots that are going to just swallow this. Listen, there are no bank accounts that these people can get. And the reasons are ridiculous. Because I can go to America and within a half an hour I walk out with a bank account. Here in Samantin, they want to know who my great-great-great-grandfather was to see where he got his money from. This is nonsense. But this is the system we are working in. And every time they want to justify this Caribbean Gilda, they find a new story. I have said it before and I'll stand by it. Dollarization might just simply be the way to go for Samantin. And we will use a monitoring system with the help of the Dutch Central Bank, like happens in, in Bonaire, Sabre, and Stacia. It can be done. We can secede from the Central Bank. It's not an overnight procedure. But we could have stuck to the money we had and continue because saying that they don't have enough bank notes, please. Maybe in Kyozo, because the man, they don't use the damn money. We use dollars and euros. I, ha I don't see that 
local money coming through. The only people that are paid with that are government officials, are government employees, and uh, some government-owned companies. Give them a chance, they too will pay dollars because they get more dollars from their clients and their customers than they get guilders. So again, the usage of dollars is the number one currency in Samantha. Maybe through the formalistical um, channels, the Gilda, the Dutch Antillian Gilda. But when it comes to the regular businesses, everybody gets made in dollars daily. So again, this whole Caribbean Gilda digitalizing it, give the people bank accounts. That, that's what we need to do. And that's what the central bank needs to do. And stop telling parliament and the country, Oh, but the regulations, we can't do nothing about Oh, you mean you can't do nothing about it? The people banking in a country where you're in charge of the monetary system. And please, this thing about, oh, the banks can pack up and go? Let them go. Let them go. Maybe then the Dutch banks will come in. And then they can take over the market. Because all this nonsense about money laundering and terrorism financing... Is a farce. We do as if in the, in the Caribbean countries, everybody is corrupt and everybody doing money laundering. They just looked at Holland. When it came to Bitcoin, one in seven Dutch people have Bitcoin. It's a matter what is it, one, one in 50, one in 100? Those that start talking, but they get picked up. So again, again, Let's get real. Talk to the people in a way that they can understand you. Tell them what's beneficial for them. But this, what's going on now, is craziness. It's craziness and it needs to stop. Now, like I said, Friday there I went to the Calypso Eliminations and I'm going to lie to you. It was a bomb. Songs, renditions, I mean, I ain't gonna lie to you. I can't wait for them to reach the village. And the uh, eliminations were sold out. And I pray to God that the finals are also sold out. And our people come out and listen to the good artists we have here that are singing for their people. You all. So come out and support them when they hit the big stage. But the juniors are coming just now. And Mighty Dow, and I think Cheryl and Arnel and them, they put a show together. It's about 18 of them, I understood. Different schools. They come in to present. And I ain't gonna lie to you, they introduced about 10 of them, I think, that night. And they had spunk. They got last spunk. So that means they come in to sing. They come in to perform. And we... We, the public, should come out and support. Not read about it the next day or hear about it the next day. The, the prices they charge, $10 and so, compared to the $100 we would pay to go and see an artist. It's sad because these are our artists. These are our future artists. We always talk about the youth is the future. But if you don't support them, they will not be the future. Because they will not go on stage when they become older. Because you don't appreciate it anyway. So come out and support the youngsters and the seniors when they go up. Now, there was a story about the lacking streetlights, not working, damaged streetlights in Ebenezer. And this story applies to much more areas than just Ebenezer. But I'm happy that the Ebenezer Council came out and spoke about it. Why? Because we talk about resiliency. We talk about safety of this nation. Yet the streets are dark at night in the neighborhoods, which giving criminals the opportunity to steal their cars, go in people's homes, etc., etc. And I understand the GB has an issue with finances. GB has a contract with the government of St. Martin that there must be so many light poles on. There have to be so many street lights on. That's what the contract stated. 
So the government maybe could have said to GB, listen, I'm going to give you some money from my capital budget to go and put on the streetlights in Samaritan and we will discount it from the payments we have to make back to you for electricity. We will take off 20% so that the investment can be paid back in a period of X amount of time. The government can do that. But I haven't heard an utter from the government. I don't know who to ask anymore in government, because one time it's this person, the next time it's that person, then the Prime Minister jumps up and says, the calm is responsible, and when pressure hits, the mouthpiece of calm is gone. So I, I don't know. I really, really don't know, and I don't care anymore. <clears throat> Bottom line is, many districts are in darkness, crimes are happening, and the government is just simply looking on. You know, like how you saw that movie many years ago, that little TV series, Lost in Space? That's what you all are. Lost in Samantha. Because it's crazy. Now, again, the trenches. I, I, I briefly mentioned it earlier. It's about 16 months now that the contract expired in October 2021, I think it was. We are now going into April 2023. A tender was held. They didn't like the outcome of the tender, so they decided not to grant the tender. Let me put it as frank as I can. And they can hide about all kind of stupidity about Oh, it wasn't done right. And oh, Mr. remember, this is the minister that came out and said that the past 30 years, we had no clue what we were doing with tenders. The tenders he has done. Garbage collection. Major fraud report by the ombudsman. Trench cleaning, still not granted. District cleaning, just granted. Major debate right now about the validity of the contract. People being called in to come to discuss their contract because funny questions were asked during the budget debate by MPs. To knock down the government building, still nothing. Listen, let me tell you something, son. You have no clue how a tender looks and how it works. That's your problem. But you always go around shooting down everybody else and oh, investigate this and oh, investigate that. You should investigate yourself. And those that are closely around you, family and friends, because it's being happening now. So like I said, it's going to start rolling out just now. And then you're going to see mothers crying and wives mourning. Because you all are doing things that you should not be doing. And these tenders are going to tell on you all and tell on you all real serious. I have held my peace because I came from that ministry. But what you all are doing is beyond abuse. You all are destroying companies that had people working for years. And I agree, if they lose the tender, fair enough. But when you come with all kind of chopadi ways of disqualifying people, no nah man, they should take away the courts and let a judge decide. Let a judge decide. Because talking to you all makes no sense anyway. That much I understood. But like I said, it was more important to go to the UN and go stand up, take pictures. I read an article today. Not one word from Samantha. Not one word. Aruba's government, Aruba's prime minister spoke about their problems in an article published in Samantha. But the minister of Samantha had nothing to say. But he was standing there grinning in a picture. This is a joke. $3,000 tickets, $12,000 per diem. And it wasn't he alone that traveled. More traveled. Top cabinet members traveled. And I saw people from back. Now, back, I understand that they are there. Because it's climate change. The poor minister doesn't have a clue what climate change means. But he's sitting down there, talking about water production, when our water production in Samaritan belongs to a foreign country. A foreign company owns our water production. Then bring it back to GB. I asked them not to extend. 
Please have GB do it. GB employees working there. But no, we talk about water production at the UN. You know, so I don't, I don't even know. I, let me not use a name for you because it ain't going to be a nice name. But maybe you should go census and change your name too. Join the partner from the airport. Let me salute though, on a positive note, the Minister of Tiat. Because for far too long, the bus terminal in Phillipsburg is overdue. Far too long. I can remember when it started building there. Then on the commissioner, Roy Madden. A good friend that passed. But as a commissioner, we initiated that project. It was Economic Affairs and Public Works. I think it was Commissioner Marlin and Commissioner Heiliger together. And we started building. And it was basically to house the buses and the taxis. Because from then already, we were going to get them out of Front Street because they used to pack up in the alley from the courthouse and the parliament building. And we were going to stop that circulation and keep the roads wide open. And we were going to bring them down there as it is. They also wanted the tour buses to come down there. Over the years, that idea changed a little bit and they moved the tour buses up by across the tax office on the WG Bancampa Road. They built up that whole piece there by the Rolandus Canal. They did that. They had even put one lower down there by Bobby's Marina. And they were going to build the boardwalk from the harbor there and the water taxis to put the people in the different locations. The tour buses were supposed to actually go to the festival village and stop there so that the tourists could have gotten a taste of St. Martin, be it with items being sold, local foods and drinks being put on the sale. That, that, that's how it was. And for one reason or another, that just got lost. This terminal was part of the project we call Changing Lanes. That used to be something that was always on the books by the Inspectorate for Public Transportation. But that has all disappeared. So I'm happy that we are talking about this bus terminal. The, the artistical drawings are nice things, but I don't think the tour buses belong in the center of town because the traffic is going to become a nightmare. Those are big vehicles. It's a nightmare when they got to turn by Wynn Island Bank or one of the other alleys uh, lower down on Canagita Street. Tour buses don't belong in the center of town. Our infrastructure doesn't lend to it anymore, whatsoever. All right. I was happy to read that the census office is doing a major cleanup. And it started since last year, September, and basically 3,908 3, people were already deregistered because they can't find them, they don't live here, whatever. I'm happy for that. Some of them even passed on, but it was still registered. Now I know about that because that happened to me personally with my old man 20 years ago in the tax office. Then you have another 3,700, there are 3,700, 3, no, 3,746, I think it was, or 3,700, someplace there, of people that are registered at census, but their residency permit is expired. This covered, listen carefully, this covered the, the period of 2004 to 2016. There are seven years still missing and the amount already was 3700 plus this is seven and a half thousand people we're talking about you know seven and a half thousand people we're talking about and i'm sure there are much much more that are going to come on this gives you a good insight though on how we have to review our country because my question is this so what happens with these people so you deregister them you 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 find all these expired permits we're we going to give them new permits is border control immigration going to do something what is it because when I spoke out about it by the landfill <laughs> they give them new houses they pay them out and then they come around and say oh most of them are Dutch Utter lies. Utter, utter lies.
But again, for me, I'm happy the census is doing a good cleanup. But please, where do we go from here? Because this is a huge group of undocumented people. 3,746 people, as the media report said. What are we going to do with them? That's what we know of right now, and much more to come. What are we going to do with them? The impact on the social system, the impact on the medical system, the schools, what are we going to do with these people? This is a question that needs to be answered. You can't dance around it. These are serious problems that this country needs to deal with. Curacao has decided to lower their profit tax with 15% and they're getting rid of all special taxes. They're doing this to ensure the economy has a chance to survive and investors will come back to the country. What are we doing? I read in the media about rolling out the tax system, but nobody seems to have a clue of what's happening. I listened to the budget meeting specifically to get a little grip on that part. Nothing was said really. But yeah, we're going to do this and we're looking at it. And nothing was said. Nothing tangible was there. Because the TWO puts a two front page of articles on Tuesday, the day the budget meeting was to start, about what they are doing and how they're rolling it out. TWA's co-ho is the Dutch team. And the government follows like a pack of sheep. Because nothing is clear. I'll get down to that piece just now because it irked me to hear the numbers and the monies that were being spent. We are being taken along for a ride and we don't even realize it. But maybe the TWO could come out with a new article and explain to the public of Samaritan what the intentions are, what the studies were done, because they said they did all the studies with all their Dutch friends and consultants uh, for 16.3 million euros thus far. So maybe you can tell us what it means for the tax office. Because when MP Emanuel said that there was an issue with the tax office, it became a personal debate on the floor of parliament about nepotism and who gave land to whom and who didn't give to whom. That's not what this country was debating. But clearly, the, the, the tactics to shift blame and shift attention was the norm of day in this budget meeting. And I think MP Westcott Williams in an article that was published and I will handle later down, hit the nail on the head. So hopefully we will find out if we are going to get something when it comes to um, this tax deduction um, from 34.5% to maybe 15% like in Curacao, so we could do something. Now, let me go over to the side care project a minute. <coughs> As a member of the Samantha Lions Club for over 30 years, it was a privilege for me to once again be part of a site project. Now, we started this back in 2000, I think we had our first one. And we did school children those days. In 2018, it became much more elaborate. We did about 24, 2500. And this time around, we did about 4,500 to 5,000 people. A lot of seniors and a lot of school going children, but also people between the ages of 25 to 55, we saw them too when there was space. Let's say a school bus was running late, we were moving 20, 30 people of that age or seniors, and we would try to help them as much as we could. Now, you must understand that I'm not gonna give you a full report right now because that report is now being prepared by the professionals, but I'll give you some observations that I personally I worked there for the whole two weeks and I, I was sometimes flabbergasted in what I saw and what we encountered. I personally was busy with testing kids, you know, cover your left eye, cover your right eye, read the letters, and there were school going children that go to secondary school, couldn't read anything 10 feet away in front of them where the letters were three to four inches big. They couldn't read them. 
and these children needed glasses right away and they left with glasses. We, we also had a lot of seniors that just simply couldn't see. And you know, there are so many touching stories. I think one of the, 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 the stories that caught me most was a little girl. Um, when she got the glasses fixed on her face by the doctor, she said, Doctor, doctor, I can see, I can see. That thing, it brought tears of joy to my face. But at the same time, I realized how, how bad our vision care is on the island. And I'm not going to point fingers. I'm not going to point fingers at government or at SFV today. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do today is explain how we can solve this problem if we really want to solve it. As a service club, we are going to continue doing what we can for the country. Um, the bingos that you support us and the raffles that we sell, that money made this project possible. That money. And we spent a lot of money. And we had great sponsors, corporate sponsors, that helped us cover stays of the doctors and all those things. But I will leave all of that praising for the Lions Club because it was their project. But what I need us to understand is that while we were testing people and the doctors were looking at people, a lot of glaucoma cases and cataract cases were encountered. And while we are going to prepare the letters, or not, when I say we, my apologies, the specialist will prepare the um, reference letters to the doctors and specialists in Samaritan, and the club will assist in getting the people in there. It is important to understand the situation the country is in, and the situation is very simple. At this point in time, in the SFV law, eye care and dentistry is not covered. It is not. We just raised the platform to 10,000 dollars a month and we made the pool of SFV insured bigger by 1,500 people. That's working people, that's not their family. Add on three people extra per family, they might have had 6,000 people extra joining the SFV ranks. So we have already made contact with SFV and we hope naturally when the reports are done to sit with government and SFV and our proposals are going to be how to allocate funds through taxation to a wellness fund for SFV where these type of things can be taken up. Now remember the national health insurance that being, is being made, done now and finalized that they said they were rolling out also does not cover eye care and dentistry. It doesn't. It doesn't do it. So we have to look at, because these are very expensive things. You know, when you start to lose your teeth, it's a problem. When you have young children can't see on a board, they can't learn, you have a problem. When seniors can't even read a newspaper anymore because they're going blind with glaucoma or cataract, then we have a problem. And it's easy to say, yeah, but government can't solve everything. It is better to say, let's find a way to do it together. And that's what this is all about. This is not politics right now. I don't have no time for politics right now. As, as somebody that genuinely cares for the population, because I've been serving for 30 plus years. I didn't just pick it up and start to wave the flag because it's politics. I've been doing this for more than half of my life in Samaritan. We need to find a way to help these people. And that will be most probably by setting up a wellness fund and the taxation of alcohol, tobacco, and sugar products can go directly to that fund. And the government can be part of setting the policy what the fund does. But eye care and dentistry has to be at the top. It has to. Otherwise, every time somebody has to come here to help children and seniors and people of the community to get glasses, 
and fix teeth. And we don't need to do that. I saw teachers there. I saw police officers there. I saw nurses there. So please, understand. Those 5,000 people that came there needed help. And that help presently isn't being offered by the country. A few of us that are in the civil servantry or work in companies that carry an insurance will give you a few hundred guilders every two years. But if a pair of glasses costs an average five, six hundred dollars with lenses and a frame, how do you pay with a few hundred guilders when 54% of your population is a minimum wage and 74% of your population earns less than 3,500 guilders a month, which is a livable wage. How do you expect that 74% to ever be able to take care of IKEA and dentistry? Think about it. Not because you're fortunate in government to have it means that others are as fortunate as us. And let us not forsake our people for stupidity. This is not politics. This is real talk, people. Let's move on. You know, <coughs> I saw an ad, airport concessions being asked or request for proposal, and I said, Lord, what a thing. Here we go again. And the thing is this. I know Bacchanal will start soon at the airport again. It's just, just a matter of time. Just, just, just a, the people that had a concession prior to Hurricane Irma, do they still have that concession? People that got concession between Hurricane Irma and now, are they still going to have a concession? I know people were pushed out already. People that used to have a concession in the airport were pushed out. And I know the airport got rid of people that were asking for money from concessionaires. We could go down that road too eventually, but not for now. Now I want to focus on the concessionaires. I know parliamentarians got concessions on the airport. Parliamentarians that are part of the coalition have concessions at the airport. So my question is this. The merry-go-round people got concessions or are going to get concessions at the airport. So the request for proposal, is that going to impede on the people that have a concession right now? That for the past 10 years have been at the airport? Are the requirements going to be set in such a stage that the local man isn't going to be able to make it because he's not going to get bank support? These are questions that we need to get answers for. This is where the government has to make sure they use the supervisory board of holding to get answers and give them to the people. And they might say, oh, Bancampa, you're just picking on the airport. No, I'm not. But I'm tired of walking in there when I travel and see people having concessions that are established on the other side of the island. And just open a little branch here to get into the airport. I got a problem with that. I ain't mentioning names yet. But please, don't take that as any type of fear. I don't need immunity, you know. I can call out what I need to call out. And I can finger those that believe that I ain't gonna do it. Because I'm sick and tired of seeing the airport, the jackass at the airport, destroy local people. I am tired. And I'm going to make it my business and mission to deal with he once and for all. Once and for all. I am tired. Really. And when I get tired, that ain't good for you. That ain't good for you. And you can go talk to anybody you want. I don't care. Understand that carefully now. It is going too far. We are... You know, listen. I, I, I heard him... Screaming about a little mini casino bar. No. Do I have a problem with that? 
We are Las Vegas, for God's sakes. We have 360 gambling points, 13 casinos, 110 lottery booths. Please. A mini casino by the airport. Once it's in the departure hall, I don't care. Because the locals can't touch it. The locals can't play in there. Because it's for the tourists. Those are the people that are returning home in the departure hall. So if that is the case, I ain't gonna make a big fuss. I think these are just machines they're gonna put in there. So I'm making a fuss for that. My position on gambling is clear on the island. Standalones gotta get clean up. All, all got to go all ten. Who don't like it? Crap or smoke your pipe. And I, I don't get intimidated. If you're coming to do something, come good. I'm going to be waiting. But this country needs help. And we got to stand up and help our people. We can't allow our fathers, brothers, mothers, sisters to become gambling addicts. When it is not needed. That's all I'm saying. All I'm saying. We need to regulate it better. Standing, standalone casinos have no added value to this country. Now all these little slot machines they're putting all over the place, that's a different story. That's a complete different story for me. Um, where we put them is going to be the discussion. I don't want to hammer down on everybody and everything and mash up everything because that's not the intention. But we got to deal with this thing the right way. I was extremely happy when I spoke about this issue last week that I received a text from a big stakeholder and said, I am willing to help you put the policy together. Because I support your position. That I am going to follow up on. Because we need to go to online gambling where we can control who's gambling. Because we have your information. So you can control it. You can tax it better. Because it's clear. The country, but our country for whatever reason ain't touching the the gambling industry, and I don't know why. And I don't want to speculate. Because everybody will start jumping up about wrong bag, I ain't going there. I am not going to accuse people if I am not aware of it. I don't do that. But we gotta deal with this thing better. We really have to deal with it better. And at the airport, because they drifted a little bit there, the concessions got to be very clear. I am going to apply for a request for proposal. Going to apply for one? So I can read what's in it. So I can talk about it and question it. Because I know it's full of nonsense. And Brian brings down his little boy from TLM here to help him down there. And believes that nobody gonna question it. I gonna question it. I tell you, I gonna question it. I tell you from now. Once I got my hand on it, I gonna start dealing with it, and then we take it from there. But why do I understand? Is why the hell we need a, a supermarket in the airport? Why do we need a supermarket in the airport? A pharmacy is another thing. Why? Why would you need a pharmacy in the airport? I can understand you have a little place that sells some um, buffering and all that. Listen, man, Miami Airport don't have a pharmacy nor a supermarket. JFK don't have them. But in Samantha, we're going to put a pharmacy and a supermarket in the airport. This is, this is BS. And nobody says nothing. Nobody. This is crazy. You know, but again, like I can say, I agree with you, Willem. In the olden days, you could enter the casino once a month. Today, they're there every day, seven days a week. And nobody says nothing. Nobody. And we wonder why 
We have these problems. We are doing it to ourselves. <coughs> Enya. Enya is in a very precarious situation and the people's pensions are in serious problems. The financial economical director of the Central Bank of Curacao, Samayat and Mr. Jose Hardim, sounded the alarm bell on the last day of the trial in appeal. And he basically said if the Ansari group doesn't compensate the monies they fleeced out of India, the central bank, who is at this point in time protecting those assets on behalf of the policyholders, is going to have to cut. You know what I just tell you? Cut in the benefits and the accrued future pensions of the pension holders, some 40,000 policyholders. And the cuts will not be small. Now, this is the financial economical director of the central bank saying this. Samaritan doesn't have the most policyholders. Curacao has much more than us in India, but we do have here. So what's the government, or in particular, the Minister of Finance position on this? Because he's the shareholder for the country Samaritan when it comes to the central bank. What exactly are we doing? Because I'm not hearing anything. And you could tell me, yeah, it's a court case. Yes, but what are the provisions if it goes wrong in courts? What happens if the judges said, well, Ansari wasn't really wrong. He had a right to do this. What, well, what happens then? Do we allow the 40,000 people to lose their policies and pensions moving forward? St. Martin and Curacao and Aruba together? borrowed that amount of money during COVID. That one billion. This is crazy. Yeah? This is craziness for going on here. And nobody is saying nothing. I haven't heard a word, to be honest with you, from the government or by extension parliament. Everybody seems to be mute about this issue. And I think this issue is too big an issue to be mute about. You might not have the solutions, but at least show you care. Up until today, the people from the towers have not been paid. And the labor office seems not to have an answer. And the courts keep saying they got to pay, but nobody enforcing. So, what's the use? What's the use? What, what are people going to do? Go down to the towers, pick up furniture and start selling it so you can arrest them then and send the stealing. But here, people 70 plus years are being abused. And all the government sits down is mute. Nothing is happening for them. So I don't expect much is going to happen for the Indian people either. But I can tell you this. I like how the wizard said it on Friday. You can't come no more. You can't come knocking no more on my door for a vote. I love that song. Because with these type of things, to have the gall to go and knock on those people's door would show genuinely the hypocrite that you are. Education and the budget. Now, the budget of 2023 really didn't have my attention because it was not realistic to me. Um, other than just a lot of blah, 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 blah. You know, there, there, there was nothing. The aspect of education caught my attention um, when, when I saw what was important. It was important for the BOP project to move some money from one place to the other place. Uh, and, and MP found that very important to do. Um, Nothing. Youth, sports, nothing. Nothing was done. Let me explain something. We talk about NEPA. We talk about the University of St. Martin. But you must talk about the money 
you give the children to attend those schools. Those are not minors. People that are attending NEPA, people that are attending USM, those are mostly adults already. Those adults have expenses. If they would go to Holland, up to a thousand euros can be given by duo in a basis burst format if they had no income. If you go to America, you get fifteen thousand dollars tuition and those things. Here, you get peanuts. You're forced to live at home. You're forced to work to make ends meet so you can put some money in the kitty cat at home so that they can pay for utilities and food, etc. And most of these things will go um, against, uh, will use your time that you should have used to educate yourself while at the university, while at NEPA. I find it a crying shame that nobody during the parliament debate thought, A, hey, let's see if we can raise the scholarship amount for NEPA students and USM students and if we have any other students attending the medical school, the DeVry Medical School, let's see what we can do for them. That these people can truly study instead of having to work to make ends meet to study. Yes, a lot of us have done that. But you know, sometimes if it doesn't need to be done, we need to learn to make better choices in our budget. That's why it was a budget full of holes and it was a budget to feel good for the government. No more, no less. Because in education, it didn't really help the institutions because you could give them a half a million more or a million more, but you're not helping those that are attending the institution. And without students, it's not going to work. And NEPA is a great school. USM is a great university. But we got to help those that are attending there a little more. I'm not saying give all them $5,000 or $10,000. No, I'm saying look at the reality cost of most of those students and see how we can help them. That's all I'm saying. And I show, I'm sure we have enough people that can look at it so that the basic tuition, the, the school materials, the transportation and housing can be looked at. Because if these students had leave St. Martin, we would have been giving them that. So why can't we help them here in St. Martin itself? Why, why is that an issue? I, I, I try to understand it, but I can't because nobody is giving a plausible explanation for that. But then again, what can I say? It is what it is. All right. This one here, I, I, I don't even know if I should really worry it anymore, but the two, the two organizations, Temporary Working Organization, that was the pre-runner to COHO, our country packages, and the followers. And the followers is our government. Because there were two articles, and... I read both articles and I don't know how this works. An interview was done by the local media with the TWO. The TWO is supposed to be assisting the government, not instructing the government, eh? assisting the government. And they said that too, how they assist with all the preparatory work, write the programs and blah, 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 all those nice things they explained and they used 16.3 million for that in 2021 and 2022. They explained that, all of that. But then they went over to what will happen and how it will happen. Which programs they're rolling out, when they're rolling them out and I'm saying, but wait a minute, but who's the government here? TWO or Jacobs Two, a tree, a tree, whatever they are now. Which one is it? Because now I'm getting confused, but also irritated. Because nobody 
has uttered a word about it publicly. I haven't read a newspaper article and I wasn't going to waste my time listening to the nonsense in Parliament. So I, I think they had 15 views. So nobody was really following the budget meetings anymore. They would just wait for the Daily Herald to write the story the next day and gobble that down as mushrooms and move on. And whatever it is, it is. <coughs> so again, for me, this went too far. 152 million euros was reserved for the country packages. I can remember the days of Knops. He said he was making 1 billion available for the seven years. For Kohu. 1 billion. Today, it's 152 million. From 152 million, 32 million is being taken off for cost. Cost to run the program, cost of BZK, cost of two and whatever and whoever. So 120 million staying over for three for five years yet, from 2023 to 2027. So that's 24 million a year for three countries: Aruba, Curaçao, and Samadhan. Samadhan being the smallest one. So are we going to get a third? The 8 million euros? I sincerely doubt it. I sincerely, sincerely doubt it. Because the previous two years, we had 16.3 million guilders, which is about 8 million euros, so about 4 million a year. So if I have to look at that, that means for the next five years, we're going to get 20 million euros or 40 million guilders. 10 million, um, yeah. 8 million guilders a year, give and take. That's going to be our share of this money. Now, that 8 million guilders is going to be used on consultants. They are not giving us money to hire our own people and pay them for the next five years to implement programs. Absolutely not. No, they are saying, we're going to bring in our people to do that. We're going to pay them. See what I mean? That's a problem. This is an organization talking about monies that the government is agreeing to with the Netherlands. And the government mute. Set the followers. Set the sheep. And this is crazy. And again, nobody is saying nothing. This is what bothers me. Is it only I don't talk about these things? Only I see this? Only I read in this? Or is it that people have reached a stage that they don't even care anymore? And they're just waiting for elections to get rid of this gang and put in another group. Because I don't know how to look at it anymore. I honestly try to be as fair as I can be. But I must be biased sometimes because this is going too far. We are absolutely not in charge of this whole thing. We are not. We are not in charge. So I don't anymore. How to look at it? I don't know anymore really what to worry about with it anymore because, again, it, I, 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 I don't know. I, 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 you know, when I read the TWO that they were going to roll out the tax programs in 2023 and the Minister of Finance says in the budget meeting that they are busy reviewing things yet and they have to still come to agreements and they, on the other hand, are talking about rolling it out. Then my question is, what the hell going on? What's really going on? Because the right hand and the left hand are surely not on the same page. You see, I think the Dutch are tired of this government trying to take credit for what they haven't done. Remember when they were giving out keys down Belvedere? The first time they got away with murder, the second time the Dutch representative reached, he was in the middle of the picture too. He was right there. Chris Johnson was right there taking pictures. Because the government did it. The government put the money in the trust fund. I'm going to come to that one just now. This trust fund, this MOU, Samantha Housing Foundation, I'm coming to that just now. But this is to show you what's happening here in this country. So I believe that with all these programs they're rolling out, National health insurance, the 30% of people not insured, they're going to be covered now. We're going to see. We're going to see.
Because at this point in time, I don't know what to believe anymore and what not to believe. But I was extremely disappointed. Two front page stories. The Herald doesn't even call the government to get a response on what was said by an entity that does not speak on behalf of this country. But the Dutch. Yep. Let's move on. Did you know? This is a new segment I decided to create. Last week I did it with GB about the meters and the water, the water leaks. But let's talk about the MOU between the government, the Minister of Romy in particular, and the Samaritan Housing Development Foundation. Now, when I saw that picture, I started to laugh. I said, okay, hypocrisy has its, its ways. It was this same minister, this same government, play back the tapes from Parliament that when the Housing Foundation had asked for 45 million to build homes, to repair Belvedere and all those things, it was this government that shot them down and said they don't trust them and they this and they that, and they were even trying to create a new Housing Foundation. How, how sh short people's memories are. Now, Vineyard Heights hit a snag. We got a judge all over the backside. You notice Dang going to place? GB Land, the police will continue shooting there because Dang didn't give up neither. Because the reports from GB are damaging. So those that had to come back to give it in coming back. So the minister decided, well, listen, I got to build something. I promised so much, I got to do something. They go and pick up a piece of land. Beside the existing homes in Hope Estate. Now, again, it was the minister said he had to clean up Vromi because Vromi and the domain and this and brown, this and all kind of, everybody was wrong. So he went to pick up a piece of land that was already given off to a local that owns a company. Local was ill. And he got that piece of land in 2012 by the then National Alliance Minister. That specific piece of land, I'm well aware of it. Because I had meetings with a gentleman about the trench that had to be placed between the property he got and the social homes from the Housing Foundation there. Because the land included the trench. And we said, all nice and well, but waterways, even if given away by government, cannot be built on. So we're going to design a nice trench and everything there, and we're going to make sure the water reaches the Rolandus Canal, which the gentleman wholeheartedly agreed with. And then you see a picture in the newspaper with the minister and the director of the Samaritan Housing Development Foundation about the sign that we used to build homes on a piece of land that was given off a second time. Now I agree, you know, the minister, he has the prerogative to do whatever with domain lands that were not granted. And if they were granted, it's a procedure to take them back. But this piece of land in particular has no end date. What does that mean? It basically means the government gave this land to that person forever. Is that something new? No, it's not. You can remember some time ago they were talking about former government, lieutenant governors, I think it was, they said, had made domain land private land. And that's something that happened there. That's basically something that happened there. Can you challenge it? I don't think so. I don't think you have the right to because it was the prerogative of the minister. Was it a good thing to do? I don't know. But I'll tell you what was good. That at this point in time, the gentleman is busy himself with the design of homes for that area. He is busy with it. Or oh, he was busy already for a while. And the minister realized that he wasn't going to give up the land 
So he just decided, oh, well, I swear to MOU, I will do blah, blah. He can't, he cannot create a new made brief. Because the made brief exists already. So you see, all these election hoax, promises, nonsense, will start getting highlighted. Because in reality, what he did was committed fraud. He committed fraud by saying he gave in this land to that person or that entity because you can't just do that. And the other gentleman still has the land in his name. So you see, Minister, liar, liar, pants on fire, I told you I'm not done with you. You're going to get your fair share of blows, brother. Believe you me. Because I'm tired. 45 million the Housing Foundation has asked for. You said absolutely not. Not you. You made sure that the trust fund went to do everything over there. Can you recall the former prime minister signing off a million guilders to fix the towers in Belvedere? Remember that? You all beat that woman down. With all she did so bad. <laughs> Look at you now. Look at you. Wait, is that country for sale? You sure they minister for sale? Let's move on. Forever, our forever illegal number plate. Now look, I love the design of the number plate. Let me, let me start with that. And the designer has absolutely nothing to do with the issue at hand right now that the number plates are not good. <coughs> Let me start with this. I spoke to the people that I believe are most competent to answer the question, are the number plates the right format, yes or no? That is the police. And by them the answer is no, they're not good. They're not good. I'll tell you this much, it wasn't the chief. So don't go harass the poor chief. But the MB of October 2011 says it all. Gives the sizes, the thickness, and everything. Now, that we have to go on the floor of parliament to show with rulers. One is 4.7. No, the other ruler says it's 5. The ruler that said it's five is what we call the fixing ruler. What do I mean with the fixing ruler? That's the spinning ruler. The numbers just move as you need them. You know, I have a little rule, you bring down the five. Yeah, she is five. Listen, anybody can see that the numbers are no good. There are different sizes of numbers. Now, this is where the illegality comes in. Your numbers have to be between five and seven and a half. Is it that you can have numbers at five, five and a half, six, six and a half, seven, seven and a half? No, I don't think so. I really, really don't think so. But again, the way it's written, it's a little vague on that. It's a little vague. But to tell people that you got three to four different number sizes and that's normal shows how stupid we can behave to justify a mistake that was made the number plates are wrong look let us not waste energy on this discussion they are here now it is the fourth month of the year let's move on eight more months the next, the next set of number plates, please, Minister, have somebody with competency for the technical aspect in the law, hand them the number plates, and hold them accountable for the quality of the number plate. The design is beautiful. You can keep it. I think the, 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 the design of Samantha so might be a little too big, might have to be compressed a little bit to get the space you need. But, hey... I don't have an issue with the design. I think it was a beautiful design and it shows the, the strength of our people. Maybe the design can be in the back. I, I Listen again, I don't want to get into it. 
The bottom line is this. The law, the MBA says what it has to be. It should have been given to the designers and said, listen, I need a plate. It has to look however you want it. But these are the requirements. These are the colors of the letters. These are the sizes of the letters. These are the thickness of the letters. These are the sizes of the numbers. These are the thickness of the numbers. So that when you have P, 10,000, it means you have a P. Instead of the little line, you all put the Samaritan um, emblem, and then you have five numbers behind. In total, you have seven spaces. And those spaces must have a width of so much and a height of so much. If that doesn't fit on the design, the design ain't no good. And the designer can then adjust their design. Because they lay that out first and you design around that. That's how that works. Don't tell people to just go design a number plate and don't give them the criteria that it has to meet. That's the problem with these number plates. Don't blame the designer. Blame the one that gave the instruction because they did not pay attention to the law. And that's why we have this problem. And coming in Parliament with more rulers to remeasure what Chris said is just idiotic. Sorry to put it this way. But I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that. I said, these fellows, are best, best we get a circus down there. And we get a ringmaster with a few clowns. Because this is just ridiculous. But hey, we like it so seemingly. So I hope that we put that saga to rest and we move on. Now, you know, before I close, let me take the much debated budget of 2023. And I'm going to use the article of MP Westcott. And it's not because I want to give her a little big up. I think MP Westcott can handle herself, been there long enough, knows the games better than me. But her article was on point. 2023 budget dressed up to look balanced, full of holes. Full of holes and dressed up to look balanced with some of the descriptions used by the Member of Parliament, Westcott Williams, to describe the 2023 budget, which was passed by a majority in Parliament on Friday, the 24th of March. It was passed 8-7. Everybody that's not part of the coalition voted against it, and everybody that was part of the coalition and had to vote party lines, irregardless that they knew the budget was no good, voted for it. That, that's what happened. It is beyond me that some persons were actually led to believe that this budget is a workable budget. Maybe on paper, but legally, legally and practically, the budget was but a dressed up way of making sure it was balanced and adopted by the 31st of March, 2023, so that they don't get an instruction. And even now, it's going to be a discussion if that budget is going to get vetted the right way, because the CFT might object to it. And then we have a different problem on our hands. I agree with you, Kemper. Police need body cams, but remember, this budget was not for that. This budget was to make some people feel good that they handed in a budget before the 31st of March, six months late, but still handed in, according to them, on time. You know, the defense by some that this budget was vetted by the Council of Advice and the CFT is yet another smokescreen, as these entities have their own responsibilities and roles in the budgetary and legislation process. Parliament's role is a distinct one of oversight and supervision. And a budget is one of the few instances that the government can be grilled by Parliament on all its stated intentions of the financial management. Exactly. So this is, this is exactly the crux of this matter. Saying that CFT did this or the Council of Advice did that, they looked at certain legislative processes and they looked at certain budgetary processes. But again... <coughs> CFT said the budget must be balanced. And the question is, has that really been achieved? Because the government is going to make amendments to the budget in June sometime, or are we going to repeat the little trick we did 
in 2022 with the budget amendment that up until this day is not approved. And then we're going to try to do some amendments in November of 2023. And I keep saying this amendment thing because in the past, eh, government was into no budget amendments, you know. When I used to work in public works, budget amendments was something that nobody wanted to do because it was always a confusion. Budget amendments are confusions. You start off passing a budget and then you start amending it. But then the budget is not balanced. Because now suddenly you're going to put 15 million more here, CFT, have nothing to say because you do No, it doesn't work. And then when you bring it back with amendments, because this is how it works. You pass a budget, the next day, you go and you start moving, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. We're moving money from here to there. And we're going to bring the amendment in November or December when we close the year. We've got all the numbers, see what we spend, what we can spend. That's how government had a time doing it. Then they stopped altogether. For years, they didn't do no budget amendments. And that's why they also didn't have no yearly um, approval reports. This minister, I think, did, what, five or six of them? Well, kudos to him. But basically, was there any added value? No, there was none. There was just a legal matter. There was no added value. Because you were approving things from 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19 that were not relevant to the budget of 2020, 21, 22, and 23. They were not relevant. So, again, you see, budget amendments are things that are, look, it's a right you have. And it's a right you should use if you had a calamity and you had to shift money from one place to another place. Those are budget amendments. And I agree. Those are needed. But what are you going to amend now in April? You just approve a budget. What are you going to amend? But they don't start talking about amendments. So you see, these are the problems that I'm saying that we have to look at carefully. And this whole budget approval if you're going to approve a budget and you're going to start doing amendments the next day or next month then what are, what, what what is parliament really checking because the budget isn't the budget the budget is just something that they have approved but they are busy amending it already and they are doing different things already remember it's an election year you know a lot of shifting will happen this year i can tell you from now and the minister will come and say oh no not on my watch they really your watch TWO watch. They, they watch what will happen. The rest thing will happen. If, as the government pur uh, purports, expectations are that the income will increase in the coming months and thus the ne necessary funds can be reinstated in the budget, why could that not arguably be put in the budget now, as was done with some items such as Airbnb and the visitors' health tax? This is what a budget is all about, projections and expectations. You cannot knowingly keep your budget lower than contractual obligations in the hope that at some point you can supplement these items. Now again, here the statement is, but you know you got those expenses, yet you will put them in the budget, but you're going to bring them later down with an amendment. Elections come in. That's all I can say. Elections come in. So, we're going to have to come with some flash programs in a few months. Blind the people with fool's gold. <laughs> Look what we do. You haven't done nothing. You're not doing anything. TWA is rolling it out and you're following like the sheep you are. Please. I think, you know, things like the National Ordinance, the National Development Vision, the Roadmap, the Economic Recovery... All of these require public-private partnerships and consultations. And these things are only done when it's convenient for the government. Instead of doing them with this budget now, they are not being done that way. And these are the highlights that I believe when you see the MP coming out and talking about it, that I say it warrants to move it forward on my show too. Government for four days was able to dodge matters such as GB, justice personnel, crime fund, consultants budget, 
tax reform, electoral reform, district cleaning, pension indexation, education institution, tendering processes, and many more. Oh, for God's sakes, in there I can pick out two or three that belong to one minister that decided he going to the UN conference for water. And he let his friend, the minister of finance, friend for himself. That's, that, that's what happened. I mean, look, you gotta, you got to understand that at this point in time, the budget was more uh, might is right. I got the numbers. I can pass it. So we can figure it out instead of, okay, what can we do and how can we do this uh, together as one? Look, there's much more that goes, goes on in the... Um, in the in the um, article, she even speaks about the hospital miraculously just started to move. The hospital won 40 million more. I don't know which budget that coming from. Maybe the trust fund is printing money now because they said their money was done. So where's that money coming from now? That's 40 million. Uh, uh, SZV and Villanova are going to have to dump 40 million more into the hospital. This is craziness. But again, like I said, there are a lot of things going on. I'm not going to continue on the budget because the budget is exactly what it is. A bunch of hogwash. But I know all those monies put, I think it was five million if I remember, was put into the capital budget without a source with this income was going to come from putting the capital budget of 2023 out of balance so again i don't know how this is going to work these and these are amendments that are made and passed eight seven these are scary moments because knowing the cft they're going to shoot it down and that means your budget has to be changed again to be approved again i I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But I'm sure all the miracles they're hoping for, well, that's a different story. Let me close with a few remarks. The country is in a very precarious situation, as we now have to see how the pensions of the India people, the policyholders, are going to be protected while the court case is ongoing. And I hope that the government and parliament by extension don't forsake these people and take a position and instruct the shareholder, the Minister of Finance, slash the government, to take a very specific, very specific stand on how we move forward. Again, the, <laughs> the MOU with Samaritan Housing Foundation, I think that's going to play out in the next few days, when the Housing Foundation see the gas 649, or uh, when the government tries to forcefully uh, take the land from the good gentleman. I understood the good gentleman has already started discussions with the trust fund directly. So he said he doesn't need the government nor the housing foundation to assist him. He can work with the trust fund directly to have the necessary social homes built. So let's see where that going. And yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, we now have a few, a few new investigations, I understood. Court cases are going to be coming just now. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, people are starting to talk. They call you. They give you stories. Now, I, I, I don't run with stories. I, I like to back check the stories first. So sometimes I don't come up to them right away. You say. They call me, Bunks, so how come you don't talk about that? If I don't talk about something that you told me, it's because I want to verify it. And I, and I, I have ways and sources to verify certain things. And... Once I can verify it, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from there. You know, look, I need to know if the government, the sitting coalition, is going to address the constitutional issues when it comes to suspension of NPs. When I asked for it, they laughed at me. And they said, oh, we got much more important things to deal with in the constitutional era. Now, it struck home. The Prime Minister was so nervous, she made an ill-timed, ill-fated statement calling the arrest 
of Rabbi Bryson uncanny and geopolitically or locally motivated and the prosecutor's office is this and that, whatever because that's what she said between the lines. Look at the end of the day. I have had my run-ins with the prosecutor's office too. And I always say there are enough steps in justice for justice to be done. And that once you deplete all the justice steps within your kingdom, you still have the International Human Rights Court. The thing is you need some money to be able to do these things. And that is the injustice within the justice system. That's the clash justice within the justice system. If you have money, you can fight. If you don't have money, you go to jail. Look, those are the things. But at the end of the day, let's be honest, my suspension, Theo Heiliger's suspension, and most probably the one of MP Bryson down the road, are all ludicrousy. Because no place else in the kingdom of the Netherlands, the other two autonomous countries, Aruba and Curaçao, are MPs suspended while fighting the legal battle that is afforded to them in the legal system that we uphold in the courts of law. If MP Bryson was held for 10 days, today, former MP Luke Marcelina would have been the new MP in there. And if we had a government or not, would have been seen depending on if he was able to work with the existing coalition. Those are political realities. Those are things that we have to ensure that we can protect ourselves again because unfortunately it doesn't happen. And I disagree with you, Shoes, that in the Netherlands MPs step down. No, MPs don't step down. They don't. What they're given is a hell of a handshake and a brilliant job in another location. St. Martin can't afford that. Curacao and Aruba can't afford that. They're too small for that. And when people are accused, give them at least the right to be able to defend themselves fairly. I was accused and after 12 years I was acquitted. So what are you going to tell me then? Sorry. Oh, we're so sorry. No. No. We have a justice system. We have a justice system. And the same way they always talk about concordance in the law, it doesn't exist here. Because a few people thought they were smart and they wanted to impress their peers. And everybody did a great job not to realize that they were the only one doing what nobody else does. Tell your elected representatives you're suspended. I can understand an appointed representative, but when the people speak, and we have trias politicas, which includes a justice wing, <coughs> don't go put in the constitution then, that if ABC happened, you're gone. Why? So then why have justice? Then why have justice? But you see, because of our old story of something that happened in Curacao, those that were there those days brought it home here. Curacao doesn't have it. Aruba doesn't have it. Holland doesn't have it. And they have had MPs that got themselves in trouble and stayed their hall. They stayed. And they fought their case. And if they lose, they're gone. If they win, they remain. Only in Samaritan we send them home. Waiting to see what will happen. Whenever it happens. You all have a blessed day. Today is Tuesday. Yesterday I laid my brother-in-law to rest. So I couldn't make it to be live with you all at that point in time. But I came back today and I ensure that today the show is a little hotter than hell. Please share my podcast and also like and subscribe my YouTube page. You all have a great week ahead. Stay safe. Bunks is out. See you all next week.